Bless the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. I want to greet everybody who is online tonight. Amen. All saints, Bishop Daly. Amen. All the saints. Amen. People who are watching overseas, people who are watching locally, I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. It's a, it's, it's a blessing and a privilege for me to be able to impart the word of God to us tonight. And I pray, God, that, you know, as we look into the word of God, that we will apply to our lives and make it a part of our lives. Amen. You know, Bishop Daly has been teaching on the subject, the book of Genesis, for a couple of weeks now and he has just given it a little, one little break amen and he'll be back in very short order to to finish that particular topic but until then tonight we are just going to be covering a small subject you know topic the power of unity something that i find to be very important to the child of god something i find that to be very important to the body of christ and i pray god that as we examine and look at this topic tonight amen that we'll be able to Amen. Apply these things and realize its importance and see what we can do as children of God to enforce unity and to do unity in the body of Christ. Praise God. We're going to be looking at the book of Psalms, chapter 133, from verse 1 to 3. And it reads like this. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirt of his garment, praise God, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descend upon the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Praise God. Now, we are fully aware that unity is something that whenever we as children of God, praise God, are in tune, amen, we realize that unity brings about accomplishment. It brings about, it, it allows things to move smoothly, amen. It allows us to accomplish a lot in the kingdom of God when we are united. And in a similar way, when we are not united, it causes chaos and it causes confusion in the body. Amen. And we are fully aware also from the Bible, when we look at the scripture in the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us a story about the children of Israel at the Tower, or well, better yet, the people at the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. And we realize something. When they were united, even though it was a negative story in the sense that they were doing something that was contrary to what God called them to do when they were united praise God we realized that they were accomplishing a lot to the point where God had to come down and and allow them to speak different languages and we know what happened at the Tower of Babel that instantly or Babel depending on how you pronounce it um, they because they were no longer united it caused confusion and it caused persons to be divided and that's what um, disunity does. Amen. But unity, on the other hand, allowed them to, uh, to somewhat accomplish some things that seemingly that they put their hearts to, that they put their minds to. Praise God. In a similar way as children of God, we must realize that once we are united uh, in what we are about to do and what we are doing for the kingdom, then instantly we can accomplish some great things for the kingdom of God. Amen. And I believe this is what David wanted to bring across as he wrote Psalms 133. Now, let us start wide. We must understand that the book of Psalms is written in a section of the Old Testament that is called the Ketuvim. Uh, Ketuvim means the writings. So the Old Testament had three-part section, and, and, and Jesus often talked about the law, the prophets, and the writings. All right? So... In that section, you had what is called the Torah or the Tenak. So you had the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. They have the um, Nevim, which is called the prophet, the prophetic books. And they have the Ketuvim. And it, that is where the book of Psalm um, was located, in the section that was called the writings. Now, within the Psalms now, um, you had uh, different divisions for the Psalms. Amen. And tonight we want to focus on, you know, there was a specific section that was called the Psalms of Ascent. 
and that was from Psalms 120 to Psalms 134. Now, what usually happened is that the, 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 the children of Israel, when they were going up to the temple on, on particular days, especially they were going up for the Passover or they were going up for the Feast of Weeks, praise God, they would have uh, sang certain songs as they move up to Jerusalem. Amen. So three times a year, they would travel and they would, enter, they, they, they would leave the synagogues and, and as a team and as a body, they would travel up uh, to Jerusalem, to the temple at Jerusalem. Now, in order for them to do this, amen, they had to be united. And they would unite together and they would sing the songs. And one of the songs that they would sing is Psalms 133, which is the psalm we just read. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, it's interesting that when I think about this, I realize that, and, it's, and, 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 I, and I would encourage us to study each of these psalm in, in from about Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. But it's interesting though that, amen, they had the, one of the things that they had to discuss as they traveled on their way up to Jerusalem, amen, had to do with the whole theme of unity. Now, what that says to me as a child of God, brethren, is that in order for us, to make it up into the kingdom in order for us to make it into the new Jerusalem. I mean, one of the things that we must enter Jerusalem with, one of the things we must have is the whole idea of unity among us. Amen. And the enemy knows that. Amen. And that is why he tries so hard to sow discord among the brethren. But brethren, as we travel up, amen, as we endeavor to live this particular life, as we travel towards the new Jerusalem, just like they would sing uh, the songs about unity or the song about unity as they travel along the way. In a similar way, we as children of God, amen, need to understand that as important as it was and, and to them, and I believe that it was something that was reminding them that, look, you need to be united, amen, in terms of what you do, praise God. In a similar way, we need to be united as children of God as we move on our way to the new Jerusalem. Now, let us look closely at that particular psalm. Amen. Firstly, the psalm says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Praise God. Now, think about that, brethren. Two things jumped out at me. One, the psalm is saying that it is good. And why it is good? It is good because it reflects God's heart and purpose of unity among his people. It is good because God wants us to be united in purpose. It is good because God wants us to be one as he is one. Amen. And, 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 and he did say that he was going to pray for the disciples that they will be one as he is one with the Father. In a similar way, he wants us to be united. It's a good thing for us to dwell together in unity. It's also pleasant. It's interesting that he used the term good and pleasant as the adjective to describe unity. It makes life together uh, much more enjoyable when we are united. But do you notice that whenever we are united, it, it, it brings about this love. It brings about brethren. Brethren, this, this, this thing for us as children of God, praise God. And it allows us to, to want to be united in purpose. It wants us to be united in what we are doing. It gives us, it gives us this, this, this enjoyable feeling, praise God. Because no longer uh, we have to be fighting against the biting and the conflicts and all of these things that would want to come in. But when we are united together, amen, there is purpose. There is, there is joy. Amen. And, and as we look at it, the word pleasant there in Psalm 133 comes from a Hebrew word, naim. And it means lovely. It means attractive. It means friendly. It means joyous. Amen. So we talk about how good and how pleasant it is you're talking about something that god's want from his heart for us as children of god something that is joyous something that is friendly something that is attractive to the child of god praise god so as brethren we have to dwell together and David had this in mind 
as it relates to the relationship that we must have as children of God. Amen. We have to be united, praise God, so that we can have a pleasant relationship one with another. We have to work together. Amen. That we might have a peaceable and live peaceable as possible as the Bible says. Amen. Because this is what God, praise God, requires of us. Praise God. Now, apart from the fact that the psalm says that how good and how pleasant it is, here it is that the psalmist uses two things to describe what unity is like. Now, like, whenever we see like anywhere in any literature, amen, it is normally a simile. A simile is where you compare something with something. Amen. So the scripture is saying how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like two things. One, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirt of his garment. And two, it is like the dew of Hermon. It is like the dew of Hermon, praise God, that descend upon the Mount of Zion. So, Praise God. When we look at the psalm, we realize that he is comparing these two things. One, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And that went down to the skirt of his garment. That's number one. And number two, he described unity amen, as the dew of Hermon that descend upon the Mount Zion. But I noticed something as I looked at this verse, and I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to mention it later on. But notice, in both of the cases, it talks about it coming down. So the oil ran down from Aaron's head to his garment, and the dew also came down from the mountain. Amen. So there's, there's, there's something there in that. But until we reach there, right now we are looking at the fact that it, it is comparing it with the precious oil or the precious ointment upon Aaron's head that they usually do. And secondly, he's describing it with the dew of Hermon. Now, what I would do as a child of God, amen, or as a person who is reading the scripture, if he's comparing it to these things, I need to go back into scripture to find out what these things are about. So let's just look first like what that precious ointment that David was talking about and see what we can pull from it. So in order for us to go there, we have to go back to the book of Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 10 to 12. And it goes like this. It says, And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times. Notice he sprinkled upon the altar seven times and anointed the altars, the altar and all of his vessels, both the laver and his foot to sanctify them. So here it is, we're seeing Moses doing something. He's sprinkling oil upon things, the altar, upon the vessels, upon the laver and his foot. But look what he did now. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Praise God. So from that particular scripture, we notice a couple of things. Let me remind you that in the Old Testament, the anointing oil was a type of or it was symbolic of the presence of God. The anointing oil was a type of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And I want you to notice something how God Use the Holy Ghost. Amen. Or use the anointing oil in the case of Leviticus chapter 8. Here it is that God was preparing Aaron to do a particular work. God was about to use Aaron to do something that was great. Amen. In, in his eyes. Something that he wanted to accomplish. Amen. In, 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 the, in Israel at the time. And notice what he did. The Bible said that he used the anointing oil and he sprinkled it upon things. So as it relates to the things that were going to be used, God would have sprinkled the oil upon these things. All right. And but upon the people who he was about to use, he would have poured out the oil. There's a difference. And he would have poured over the head of the priest in a great measure. What am I saying? Here it is that David is comparing, praise God, unity. And notice he's saying unity is like God pouring out the oil upon the priest. Now, you might say, okay, in our time, 
Um, what does that mean? That, that, that has not much um, weight to it. But there are two things that comes to mind as it relates to the culture, praise God, of the Jews. One, it is a normal thing for when somebody to come to a person's house, for them to anoint them, uh, their head with oil. Praise God. Now, if you look at it carefully, you can remember the story with uh, Jesus and, in, and, and he was um, going to the house of um, Simon, praise God, the Pharisee. I remember that scripture where the Bible said that a woman, she was practically a woman who the Bible said was a sinner. Amen. The Bible said when she anointed Jesus' feet and she did all of these things and, and Simon said in his heart, if this man was a prophet, he would, have, he would have known that this one was a sinner. Jesus addressed a couple of things to him. And one of the things he said, he said, for my come, you didn't even wash my feet. And for my come, you did not anoint my head with oil. And why he said that? Because it was a norm for them to anoint the head, praise God, of their visitors with oil. It was a form of comfort. It was a form of refreshing to whoever came into the house of that person. So that was the first thing that came to mind. Secondly, the anointing oil in the case of uh, what we read in the case of Leviticus was for two purposes. It was for one one, it was for the purpose to consecrate the people or to set them apart. Now, I want us to understand this. Now, when they say it was to consecrate the people or to set them apart, I realized that why he could have linked that to unity. One, the Bible says that in St. John chapter 13 and verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. In other words, just like how God would have used the anointed oil as a means of consecrating Aaron and any other person who would have been high priest later on, amen, to set them apart in a similar way when we are united, amen, we are set apart, we are different. It means that the moment we are not united, we are not set apart. If they are symbolic of the fact that the anointed oil consecrated the priest, it means that we need to check ourselves, praise God, if we are not being united together in mission. So the world will know that we belong to Jesus Christ when we love one another. And that sets us apart. It makes us united. And trust me, when you love people, it makes you united in purpose. Amen. True love for one another will actually lead us to unity and it takes the holy spirit to produce such a love amen that is why the anointed oil consecrated them it was the holy ghost that set him apart in a similar way it is the holy ghost that puts the love in our hearts that makes us love each other and sets us apart so that people when they see us they know that we were consecrated we are set apart for his purpose also, it signified that the anointing was upon the priest. Amen. So in other words, when, 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 when the, the oil was placed upon him, it signified that the anointing, amen, the presence of God was upon the priest. Praise God. So in a similar way, when we are united, it means that the anointing is upon us. And can I tell you something? We cannot get the true anointing upon us until we are united in purpose that's a principle that we see in scripture no matter how much you think that you can accomplish things on your own you're going to learn quickly that praise god we need each other amen and that is why the bible is very careful with how it uses words it's very careful with the words that it uses, amen to present a particular principle so the bible says in in the book of Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. And that, that's talking about the Holy Ghost that came there upon the day of Pentecost. And interestingly, the day of Pentecost is, is, is what is, I think it ends the Feast of Weeks, if my mind serves me right. And remember I tell you, they had to go up to Jerusalem. Amen. And this is one of the feasts that they would have sung as they went up to Jerusalem. So the scripture says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 to 4. Look at it. It says, And when... The day of Pentecost was fully come. In other words, that, that, that feast of weeks was fully come. But I said they were all with one accord and in one place. So unity is 
you, 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 you can see the link between unity and the anointing oil that came down. Because guess what? Because they were united, suddenly there came a soul from heaven upon like a rushing mighty wind. And the Bible said it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What took place on the day of Pentecost? This was God anointing them. Just like the priest would have been anointed. And just like how David come here the anointed oil that came down on the priest praise god that ran from his head even down to the skirts of his feet amen in a similar way because we are united then suddenly something is going to happen can i tell you brethren we are we we, we have not yet begun to see amen the true reflection of the shekinah of god any day we come to church with a united expectation with a united purpose with a united uh uh, thing in our hearts for God, amen, and to worship Him and to glorify Him. I can tell you, they're going to get a suddenly anointing. The anointing oil is going to be poured out. It's not going to be sprinkled like it did upon the upon the things, but it's going to be poured out like it was upon people. And that is the first thing that David wanted us to understand. I believe that when there's unity, the presence and the power of His Holy Ghost will be present and operating amen it also says that god come and is blessing where the unity is so guess what whenever there is unity in the body and this is what the devil is attacking brethren even in this last day whenever there is unity in the body and unity is not uniformity we can talk about that but at the same time the devil wants to attack us in terms of where what he wants to do and he knows that whenever there is unity we can accomplish a lot of things Amen. For the kingdom of God. So, firstly, he said it is like the precious ointment that ran down upon the beard. Even Aaron's beard that went down to his skirt. And we'll talk about that. But he also used another simile. He said it is like the dew of Hermon. As the dew that descend upon the Mount of Zion. Praise God. And I wanted to show you a, a picture of, 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 what, um, of what the Mount of Herman looks like no that is what it looks like it's it's practically um on the northern border of what of what the Amorite kingdom used to be and a matter of fact when Joshua uh conquered the land praise God he gave this particular section to the half tribe of Manasseh and it was east of the Jordan River so it is it, the Arab people to this day they call it the snowy mountain because of of, of, of its height and if you know anything about um, Jerusalem and, and, and Palestine and that area, there is, it's not very rainy. Amen. But you have certain places like this particular place where it is very high. And they call it, the, the Arabs call it the snowy mountain or the, the white snow or something like that. They call it a term for it. And, and, and that's a good picture of how, that's a picture of how it actually looks even to today. Now, why is the Dew of Hermon important? Amen. Now, uh, what is the Dew of Hermon and why is it important? Let us look at this. Because we want to get an understanding behind what David was trying to say when he wrote Psalm 133. Now, the Mount of Hermon was a mountain that was very high above the valleys and the plains of Palestine. And just, uh, it was practically one of the highest peaks there. It was about 9,000 feet above sea level. Praise God. And it is said that the mountain was so tall that it was even visible from very great distance. So you could stay far off and you could see this mountain. The mountain range is about 30 miles in length and about 15 miles wide. That was how big the mountains were. Now, one of the... the, 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 the attributes about the mountain was simply this because of its height it was practically almost in the clouds it was it was it was, it was there now it's in the other parts of palestine um, outside of the mount of Hermon. they used to have not a lot of rain now people like myself who come from the, the, the caribbean and and we, we we are used to having our rainy seasons and and therefore it's, it's probably don't mean a much a lot to us but to them who live in that area, they knew that sometimes they didn't get rain all the time. Amen. But there was a place that was called Hermon. Amen. And they, it was because of its height and because it was so close to the clouds and because it, it, it gave a refreshing dew. 
It gave us, it was, it was always rainy. Amen. And in a similar, notice I said, in a similar way, the oil would have flowed from the head of Aaron down to him skirts. In a similar way, the raindrops, because it was so rainy upon the Mount of Hermon, it would flow from the top of the mountain and, and, and would flow down to the bottom of the mountain. And people would be refreshed by the water that comes from the top of the mountain. What God is saying, brethren, is that we are missing out on a blessing, praise God, whenever we are not united. Whenever we are not united, we are living in a season of drought amen the water that should flow from the top of the mountain down to the bottom praise god is not there because we are not refreshed the oil that should flow from aaron's head down to his feet is missing because we are not united now i want us to understand brethren that both oil and water are very important one oil as i said before was signif signifying praise god it signified the anointing oil, but water have a way of signifying life. Amen. And it means then that life is, 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 is prevalent in the body of Christ when we are united. Amen. We get a lot of water refreshing our soul when we are united. And you're going to realize that at the end of the day, the true blessing that comes that people would get. You, know, you, ever, you ever been a thirsty, very thirsty before? And you need water. You need something to drink. Amen. And when you get that water, it is so refreshing. It is so, it is so, it is so thirst quenching amen in a similar way when we are united in body there is a there is a presence that comes in our midst that is refreshing to the soul there's a presence that comes into our midst that makes us clean and wash us and makes us to the person we are supposed to be in the body of christ how do we accomplish this brethren how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity i pray god that somebody tonight will understand Understand that there is anointing that comes with the oil I want us to understand that there is a blessing that comes from the Mount of Hermon it's that dew and can I tell you something the Mount of Hermon is always green and refreshing as in comparison to the valley that was dry and therefore they enjoyed it and David as you can imagine as they are marching up to that mountain and singing amen how good and how blessed and how pleasant it is for brethren and they are looking as they're going up to Mount Jerusalem they are looking and they are looking back at what God has done with the priest and they are looking back at how God can wash us in water what a blessing that comes brethren when we are united and this is what David wanted us to understand but David made a, a closing statement as he as he as he as he looks at that him saying for there the Lord command the blessing Look at that. Where? He said, for there the Lord commands the blessing. Where? Where does the Lord command the blessing? In unity. Notice the Lord didn't just say blessing. He command the blessing. Think about a commander who is in charge of something. When he gives a command, amen. Think about the army. When he gives a command, the soldiers fall in place and they come and they do what they're supposed to do in a similar way whenever there is a unity god has already commanded that there's supposed to be a blessing a blessing is already there when we are united it is when we are united then true blessings will come some of us are getting some little drops here and a little drop there. But can I tell you, brethren, there is something that happens when the child of God is united. There is something that happens, amen, when the child of God comes together and decides, look here, we're going to put aside some of the isms and the schisms and some of the stuff that the enemy would want to introduce into the body. We want to put that aside because guess what? We want to have a blessing. Let us look at two blessings we get from unity as we, as we tr try to explore even this psalm um, a little bit more. First of all, I want us to understand that one of the blessings that we get, praise God, is the blessing of protection. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24 to 28, praise God, it says, For there be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Note, they are exceeding, not, not just wise, they are exceeding wise. I love that. He said the ants are a people. They are not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. 
the conies are but a feeble folk yet they make their houses in the rocks my god now what this part of highlight it said the locusts it have no king yet they go forth all of them by bands and they go to say the spider take it whole with her hands and is in the king's palace now if we should stop and this psalm, this proverb was written by a guy by the name of Agor. And we learn lessons in life by, by one, we can study it. We can learn a lesson by studying. We can learn a lesson, praise God, by experiencing something. So there are some lessons we learn by experience. We have gone through some things and, 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 and based on the experience that we have in this particular thing, we can go on to say, praise God, that we have learned something. But you can also learn things by observation. And I think this is what Agar was doing. He was observing uh, four little creatures. Amen. Who he said they were little. And, 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 and it makes me wonder. Here it is that these creatures are inferior to the human being. But the Bible called them that they were exceedingly wise. The first is talk about the ants. The ants in the case of the ants. And I'm not going there. But I just wanted to understand that the ants speaks to the principle brethren of preparation in other words the ants prepare themselves for the season that was coming can i tell you brethren we have to prepare ourselves with meat for the season now what does that mean the meat that we have is the word of god and we need to have a word for every season Things not going to go smooth all the time. And things going to go good sometime. But guess what? Wherever it is, whatever our season is, summer, winter, autumn, or spring, amen, we have to be prepared ourselves for that particular season. You talk about the conies. So here we're seeing preparation with the ants. Then we are seeing the conies. We talk about location or position. So the cony ensure that they made their house in the rock as children of god we have to ensure that we are positioned in a place amen where jesus is our rock amen so we are safe inside the rock you talk about the spider he will have no hands yet he's in king play talk about privilege as a child of god we are privileged because we are nobody but yet we will find ourselves in the king's palace it reminds me of the story that that minister matok spoke about um methy Boshe, who was uh lame in the feet but get still was at the king's table we find ourselves at the king's table even though we were born in sin and shape in iniquity we were lame in our spirit praise god but god gave us privilege but tonight i want to focus on the locust the bible said the locust has no king and i underline it yet they go forth Praise God, all of them by bands. Now let us kind of, kind of description what blessing comes from this, what we can learn from this. You see the locust brethren, is, it is said that the locust is a very small insect. Its body is about uh, 10 millimeter to about 120 millimeter. And it, it wingspan is about 250 millimeters. It is, it is like, in my opinion, it's like a big grasshopper. So it's like a big version of what we call a grasshopper. Amen. It looks just like it, but it's a little bigger than it. All right. Another thing was note about the, 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 the locusts is that they tend to be solitary insects. In other words, truth be told, they, the locusts, them really stay by themselves for the most part. Uh, they, they, they don't move together. They don't move with a team. However, another thing, before I go there, another thing is that the locusts, what they would do, they would, they would, they, they jump and they, they use their legs to, to jump. A lot of times they think they are flying, they have the wind, but what they do, they, they elevate themselves and the wind would have brought them so they can jump about four feet, four to five feet. That is like a man jumping about uh, 200 feet. So, which is, which is, which is hard. So it, it showed the strength of the locusts. So when they jump that five feet, the wind would have taken them and carried them where they need to go. So that's how they operate. A locust by itself is not a scary instrument. Not a scary insect at all. One locust, unless you're afraid of insects, but one locust, you can easily squash it. One locust, you can easily just get rid of it. But you see, during the dry seasons, this very solitary locust 
no understand not only the bible said they are exceeding wise they are solitary in a season but whenever time get dry and they can't find the vegetation that they need they combine themselves together and guess what they happen they form a swarm of locusts and wherever vegetation is that's where they're heading now he said that a swarm of locusts while one locust is is is, is easy to deal with a swarm of locusts brethren is scary it is a fearful thing and guess what a swarm of locusts is almost impossible to stop praise god now uh, let me show you some examples in 1915 it is said that and and this is in modern time it is said that locusts covered israel and syria i can check it out now what took place is that they swarm and they, 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 the amount of them that came practically was over Two million locusts. There, there were so much that they, they, they said that when they look at them, it almost blocked out the sun. That was how much locusts that took over the land. And they said that on a particular day, they would go about 400 to 600 feet and they would devour every type of every form of vegetation in their way. As I said before, one locust could not have done this. But combined together, they are a force to reckon with. Praise God. It is said that. In recent times, in about the period 2019 to 2021, that's recent times during the COVID time, it is, there was a swarm of locusts that attacked Africa. They were in Ethiopia and Egypt and Somalia and parts of Sudan and Kenya and a couple of these places, I'm calling the Horn of Africa. And it, 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 you can imagine, coupled with COVID, I mean, there was a whole heap of uh starvation and it caused a whole heap of problems because the vegetation were being attacked and it was hard to stop what does that teach us amen there are some things that we will never accomplish praise god and by ourselves there's some stuff that we can learn praise god from the locusts they are small but they understand the power of unity amen the devil knows that the day we understand that as brethren when we combine together amen we can take over this country when we are combined together we can take over this land i i strongly believe brethren that is one of the reasons why it is so difficult amen even as apostolics for all of us to be united you know why because the devil knows that any day in name day we get this unity right any day in name day people start putting down and notice the scripture said they have no king that was i found that part interesting in other words the only king that would would, would be their intuition that was given by god in a similar way we, we, we sometimes we want to become lords over god's heritage and therefore we have people nobody wants to settle for one thing everybody wants to rule but any day in day we understand the purpose and what god has called us to do amen we might be small but if we are combined together, we can devour everything the devil has. More can be accomplished when we work together than work separately. In other words, one locust is not scary. Two locusts is not scary. But a swarm of locusts can, can, can devastate a particular vegetation. Christians combined can devastate the devil's kingdom. The moment we decide that we are going to be united, there is a protective power. I mentioned before, it, is, it was a fearful thing for people when they tried to look at the swarm of... If you remember in the case of Egypt, amen, when, 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 when the, the, the locusts came, it was one of the plagues. It was considered to be one of the plagues because guess what? It caused problems in Egypt. In a similar way, we can cause problems in the devil's kingdom. We just need to get this unity thing right. Hallelujah. We just need to get this unity thing right. No wonder Jesus, when he sent out the disciples, the Bible said he sent them out two by two. Not that one could not have got the, the task, but I think he was trying to get them to understand the principle of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward of their labor. In other words, when two work together, we accomplish a lot. But guess what? Two can work together except they be agreed so we need to be in agreement so that we can accomplish a lot for the kingdom of god amen it, it, it brings a protective power that will blow your mind i want to bring our attention brethren praise god to a, 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 a lesson from history 
all of us know about the great wall of China. And we have heard about this place so much. Amen. But there's so much things we can learn from history itself. I tell students all the time, even Bible school, that everything is a sermon seed. You know, amen. God, God has given us a lot of things that we can use and we can learn from. Now, according to history, the Chinese, many ages ago, they built this great wall. And it served a specific purpose. One, it was used to keep out the invaders that were coming from the north. So there was a war that was taking place and it was supposed to keep out the invaders amen that were coming from the north the northern nomadic invaders people that were coming to 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 attack china so they decided look here we need to build something that would keep these people out amen and and, and therefore we need to build it in a particular way that it is very strong and that it will be able to create the protection that we need now they understood the principle that look here walls play a very important role especially in ancient times that is why nehemiah was so hurt when he realized that the wall was 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 torn down because it means the protection of the people were torn down so they decided that they were going to build this wall very great the dimension of the wall was about 15 miles stretch uh, 1500 miles stretch and it was about 12 to 40 feet wide and 20 to 50 feet high that's the wall of china now let me tell you something about the wall it is said that it is one of the only man-made structure that can be seen from space when, 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 when they look down um, from space they can actually see the wall of china that's how massive the wall was it is built like on top of it, chariots would have would have would have driven on the wall, and and if, if anybody was attacking from the this from outside, it was hard for them, amen, to accomplish anything because guess what? They would have seen them from far, and they could not have penetrated China because one, they can't break on the wall. Two, it is hard to climb. Three, you can't, it's very, it's going to take a long time for you to get around it. So the height gave them superior advantage over their enemies. Can I tell you something, brethren? The Bible says we are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. There are some things about the child of God that gave us advantage over the enemy. No matter what the enemy thinks, God has put place us at a place where we are we are high above the enemy we can see the enemy coming from far if you have spiritual discerning amen and and, and every child of god amen who, who walks the face of this earth should be able to detect when a foreign object is coming towards the body that is why a lot of times people get fever what your body is doing is saying that there is something that is foreign that is coming towards the body. In a similar way, when the Holy Ghost raises a standard, amen, there is some heat taking place because there is a foreign object coming towards the body. And we are located at a position that we can see far off. And God has given us everything we need to protect us in this time. So the heights gave them a superior advantage over the enemy. They knew that they had protection in their body sufficiently against anything that the enemy would have come with. Praise God. Now, it is said that in the first 100 years, praise God, of the Great Wall of China, the nation was invaded three times. Now think about it. You have everything you need. You are seated high. You have a wall that is that is how much miles in length. Cannot, you can't go under it. You can't go above it because of how tall it is. Um, chariots and soldiers were placed on it. How is it that persons were able to penetrate the wall of China? Let me tell you what they did. An enemy bribed, in all cases, the gatekeepers and entered China undetected. Brethren, can I tell you something? There are some things that the enemy will never be able to accomplish once we are united. You see, once somebody decides that they are going contrary to the plan, it creates entrance for the enemy to come in. And that is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 3, 24 to 26, that if a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand and hath an end. In other words, Jesus made this statement because in that 
particular verse, they were saying that Jesus was casting out demons by Beelzebub. And Jesus had to address the matter and say, look, if, if I'm casting out demons by Beelzebub, that wouldn't make no sense. Because Beelzebub is a demon. And why would a demon cast out a demon? So he is making the principle which we can apply. Children of God, we have to be careful that we, what we are doing is not attacking the body and going contrary to the body. Because what we are doing, brethren, is letting in the enemy to come into the body. That is why, as children of God, we must be united in terms of what is written in the word. We must be united in what the word of God says. You cannot have people for the church, and at the same time, you're coming to church, you're preaching something from the scripture, but on the outside, you're doing something contrary. What you're doing, you are, are, you are allowing the enemy to come into the body undetected. Amen. You can remember, Achan practically took something that was not supposed to be he he went against the command of the commander and he took the babylonian garments and he placed it under his tent and guess what the children of israel lost a battle that they should have won at ai in a similar way brethren whenever we allow some things to come into the body amen and allow some things to enter it it means that we are going contrary to what the rest of the body believes and what the rest of the body thinks amen it is good for us that we are united in purpose it is good for us that we are united in doctrine amen that's what the bible said he has given some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers for the working of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come to the unity that's important point because the devil knows that once that we are not united praise god he can invade he can tell somebody look here you don't need to do that now you don't need to listen to pastor you don't need to do that you don't need to listen to the elders nothing not going to happen and you are low you are bribed by the enemy you are influenced by the talk of the enemy did god really say god never really mean that and he allowed the enemy to come in and to invade the body brethren we have to be careful that we don't allow anything to come in and cause a problem in the body what are the responsibilities and the lessons that we can learn from what we have said so far one lesson one we are stronger together than we are by ourselves let me say that again we are stronger together than we are by ourselves. I know all of us want to accomplish some things and we want to do uh, mighty things for the Lord. But we need to understand that, look here, if we work together, what we'll accomplish is far greater and far more reaching than if we do it by ourselves. Amen. And that is why Jesus said, when Jesus said, greater works than these shall he do. He was not talking greater in the sense of the fact that we're going to do something that Jesus could not have done. Amen. Because you can tell me something that you can do that Jesus did, that, that, that Jesus couldn't do. I don't think that's the case. That's not what the scripture was talking about. But what he was talking about is the reach. Because guess what? In the case of Jesus, Bible said, um, if you plant one seed, you're going to get back a tree. Amen. And the tree is us, which has multiple seeds. So in other words, Jesus was able to penetrate Palestine. But when the Holy Ghost came, the anointing, the unity came, it caused a greater work. So we are greater together than what he could have done by himself as a man. In one man, he was able to, to influence Palestine. But guess what? When he got the disciples and he sent them out, amen, when Paul went on his missionary journey, even when there was a division in a sense, and Mark John went here and Paul went here, and they went all over the place, and they went to the gospel, and the disciples were a persecution in Jerusalem, and people had to go down to Samaria, and the issues that happened, what was taking place is that the gospel was being spread. And the more people that came into the body, the more the reach was. That's what the enemy is attacking. We are stronger together. You can imagine if we are united in purpose, and we are united in doctrine, and we are united in belief, and we are united in what God is calling us to do. My God, what a powerful thing. Number two. Never diminish the importance of unity in the body of Christ because if we do not run, we run the risk of being invaded by the enemy. As I said earlier, because somebody decided they're going to take the bribe, amen, and go against the united effort of China, it allowed people to come in in a similar way because somebody decided to take the bribe of the devil, it allows the enemy to come in and it can cause problem in the body. Number three, the enemy will attack and cause infection. In fact, ineffectiveness and destruction when we are not united. So there are some things that we will never get. There are some things that we will never accomplish. Amen. If we are not united. Praise God. Now, let us move to the other blessing. Blessing number two. 
We said before, we accomplish more when we are united. So, blessing number one was simply the fact that we have protective power together. United together, we have protection. We saw that with the wall of China, it created, united together, they decided to build a wall that was very tall, but somebody allowed somebody to come in. The locusts united, it created a blessing called strength for them. But number two, praise God, we realize that, praise God, that we can accomplish much more when we are united. So we look at Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, So build we the wall, praise God. So build we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. They were decided that they were going to come together and work to build this wall. Amen. So the wall was finished in the 20th and 50th day of the month, Elam, in 50 and 2 days, so 52 days, and the wall was done. So praise God. So let us look what happened here. Let's get a background behind what was taking place. Now, the book of Nehemiah, Amen. Was is what is what is called one of what is called one of the post uh, exilic prophet. He is a prophet that wrote uh, during a time after they came out of what is called Babylonian captivity. Praise God. So what had taken place is that the children of Israel were disobedient, and God decided, praise God, to to send Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar came and brought them down into Babylon. Now couple things happened when he brought them down into Babylon. Apart from the fact that he took slaves into Babylon, and you can, we know the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. We know what took place. And Ezekiel too was one of the prophets who were also in Babylon at the time. Uh, Jeremiah is one of the prophets that we call a, a pre and a exilic uh, prophet in the sense that he existed during the Babylonian captivity and existed before. So he will live during the two times. But we know what happened when, ne when, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded, he destroyed Jerusalem. He burnt the city. He, he destroyed the walls. So by the time they spent their 70 years in Babylonian captivity, what had happened is that news came to ne Nehemiah that look here, there is something that is happening in Jerusalem. Somebody went and looked back and realized that, look here, the place was destroyed. It was in ruin. The enemy who invaded the particular place destroyed and messed up the place. And the gates that were there, all the different gates that they would have around Jerusalem, the fish gate and all of these gates, the dung gate, all of these gates were practically burnt with fire. And it hurt Nehemiah's heart because you can imagine you're looking back at your city, the city of Jerusalem, the place that speaks to the peace of God, Jerusalem, uh, Salem, Salom, where we get the word Shalom from, peace, Jerusalem, the city of peace. And this is the place that David had made when he became king, the center of worship. So the walls were ruined and destroyed by the invasion of the enemy. And the gates were burned with fire. And, 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 and he had a problem. He said, look here, I can't sit here. So he spoke to the king and he asked the king, look, look here, um, my walls. And he was a cup bearer of the king, you know. And he said, look here, my city is destroyed. I'm going to ask for a little time that I can go and, 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 and deal with what was happening there. But he also realized that one of the reasons why his city was in ruin because of the sin that had taken place by his forefathers. Amen. So we need to understand that there are some things that we're probably not getting that we should get because there can be sin in the camp. There's, there's some things, some walls that are broken down because there's sin. There's some things that, that, that God would want to do among us. Amen. I strongly believe that when people come into the house of God, amen, and, and I hear the minister preach about it the other day that the gift of healing, I believe that people could walk into the house of God and if we are united, there's a presence that will come down that people will live healed. I, I, I want to see the day when I come to the house of God, somebody come in a wheelchair and, and walk out. Somebody, the dumb people that we, we, are, that we have to sign to. Amen. Well, I would love to see that one day the presence of God is, is so rich among us. We are so united in giving God praise and worship that there's so much power in the house that the people in ears just pop open. They might hear. Amen. I would love to see. Amen. That, that people who come into the house of God and they are blind, instantly the eyes of the eyes, their eyes are open. Why? There is a sin condition and it causes a breaking down of the walls. 
and Nehemiah realized, praise God, that there was an issue here. But he wanted to accomplish the task for God. And in order for him to accomplish the task, there are a couple of five things that he had to do. One, he understood that there was a mission. He understood that, look here, he, he understood that, look here, there is something that is wrong. And the first thing he tried to do in Nehemiah chapter 2 is that he examined the wall. If you can remember, he went, before he even called anybody, he realized the condition of what was taking place. He went to, to Jerusalem himself and he examined what was taking place in, 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 in Jerusalem. Brethren, in order for us to really get where we need to get, we need to first start with observation. We need to watch and, and, and examine what is taking place. Are you just happy with coming to church? There must be more to God than this. We have read in the book of Acts where God did some mighty things. We have read in the book of Acts where God did some powerful things. Amen. And I strongly believe, and well, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says he's immutable. He does not change. In other words, if God did it yesterday, he can do it today. If God did a thousand years, it, there's nothing that God takes God by surprise. Amen. There's nothing that is too hard for God. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. If there's an equation, brethren, amen, and something is wrong, or there's a difference with the out put of the equation it means that something has changed in the equation now god cannot change so he's a constant in the equation it's like y equal mx plus c the c is constant it does not change for you plug that c it does not change it means then that there is something wrong with the y and the m and the x and those y m and x is me and you praise god in the sense that there is something that we are not doing so the first thing we have to do as children of god is to examine the wall we need to understand what is taking place in the mission the second thing you do is understood their role in the mission so apart from the fact that he now examined the wall he called the people amen and he he gave each and their individual roles we don't need to be jealous over each other amen about what this brother does amen some preach some teach some play instrument some sing amen some altar worker some so on and so on in the body of christ but each role in the body of christ is very important amen can you imagine amen if one day you get up and your eye decide that you want to be the foot my God. Can you imagine if one day you get up and your ears decide that I want to speak? Or better yet, your left hand decides that you want to be the right hand. It's going to cause confusion. Amen. And guess what? Your body is not going to operate in the way it should. So Nehemiah, what he did, apart from the fact that he examined the wall and he realized where the, the loopholes were and what was broken down and what needs repairing, he got the people together and he got the people who were good at, at their particular task. Amen. And he said, look here. Uh, they, they, look here. This is what we're going to do. So some were masons and some were, 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 were soldiers and some were set to watch. But everybody knew their task. Some of them probably even brought water, amen, to people. But every single task that was there was very important. And if you understand your role, then you will have a common mind toward the task. In other words, when I come to church, it's not about Bishop Daly. It's not about um Ella Marlon Bailey it's not about the musicians it's not about the singers it is us working together to accomplish one task what's that one task that we might praise God win souls for the kingdom of God what's that one task amen that we might devour and destroy the devil's kingdom because we have one enemy the enemy is the devil the enemy is the world the enemy is our flesh that's our enemy and we have one task as a body so we understand the mission we examine the world we come together and we decide that look here you go and do this or this is what you are good at so you do that you are good at this you are good at that you do that amen so you understand also that unity, when you decide to do something like this, you have to understand that this will not come without a challenge. So guess what happened? There was threat. There was constant threat being sent to, amen, to the people of God. And can I tell the enemy, I'm going to talk about that, wants to challenge our unity. He knows that, look, there are some things that if I introduce into the body, amen, it's going to cause disunity. So what did Nehemiah do? He identified that they were enemies. And guess what he did? The Bible said he set up watch. 
In other words, as children of God, when we examine where we are and we start to build back the unit together, we need to set up watch. We need to look out because there are some things that are that, that we were born with. There are some things that are in the body. If you are not careful, it will slowly come into the house and cause division, hallelujah, among us. But as children of God, we have to identify the, who the enemy is. One preacher put it Sunday, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places identify who the enemies was or who the enemy is and set up watch against the enemy amen so let us identify some of the enemies that the enemy want to come with praise God one of the enemy that we want the enemy want to introduce into the body of Christ is the enemy of unforgiveness that's an enemy brethren Bible says, mortify the deeds which are in your body. Amen. It's an enemy. We have to put to death. We have to set up watch. We have to identify some of these things that are causing this unity in the body. So the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, 14 to 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, a lot of us, are not getting what we're supposed to get because we don't forgive people and because we don't forgive people god in turn don't forgive us so a lot of us are walking into the kingdom amen with strange fire i was telling a lesson the other day and i was telling people that the whole sanctification process starts at the brazen brazen altar that's where and get what happened at the brazen altar the fire came down from heaven and that was the same fire that was used to lit everything else that took place in the tabernacle and that was the problem where the two, the sons of Aaron, decided that they were going to use strange fire. Not the fire that come down from heaven, but their own fire. And the Bible said instantly a fire consumed them. What am I saying, brethren? Is that a lot of us are brazen enough thinking that we can come into the presence of God and we have not forgiven people. And it's causing problem. Causing this unity in the body. The Bible said in Ephesians 4, 26-27, Praise God that be angry and do not sin. He said, don't let the sun come down on your wrath and give no opportunity to the devil. So enemy number one shows us that we, we can be angry. If somebody does something stupid or something, or something that hurts your feelings, it's human. God give us room to be angry. Read St. John chapter 2 carefully. Let's see what Jesus did when they, when they decided that they were going to gamble into the house. The Bible said, God make whip. And God deal with them case. Jesus did it. Jesus. Nice Jesus. Bishop David said gentle Jesus. Amen. The person who we think. Amen. He shows us that you can be angry. But guess what? You should not let the, the sun come down in your wrath. You can't be angry with someone for 10 weeks. 3 weeks and you're still vexed. To the point where you, you, in your heart you have not forgiven. You have to forgive. Let it go. And make God deal with it. But forgive the brother. The second enemy we need to look out for is the enemy of jealousy. Amen. So the Bible says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hereto you were not able to bear it, neither were you not able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one said, I am of Paul, and one, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? So he's saying that, look here, there's some issues here. There's some issues of jealousy and, and strive and envy among the people. And look here, Paul, officer, look here, at the end of the day, when you behave like that, you are, it shows clearly who you are. You are not, you can't give you meat. And here's Paul writing to a church that was very powerful. I think I said it Sunday. In terms of the church of Corinth, they were powerful in terms of the gifts of the spirit in operation. History has it that that church had all nine supernatural spiritual gifts working. That's why Paul had to address them and tell them how to operate the gifts. Amen. But while they were operating the gifts, praise God, they were a carnal set of people. They were who is for Paul and who is for Paulus and who jealous and who are do this. And Paul was saying, look here, why are these things named among you, brethren? God don't like these things. God don't like jealousy. You don't need to be jealous over anybody's gifting. Because at the end of the day, when we move before God, all of us, God is going to judge us based on what he gave us. 
And when God judge you, you make sure you don't lose, lose your Stephanos. Stephanos is the Greek for the crown that you're going to get. That's a, a crown of reward, a crown that speaks that like a, 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 like when you run the race. Praise God, and, and, and you win the race, they would give you a Stephanos in those times, a, a, a victor's crown. Don't lose that, because you decided to look over the fence, and the person you want to preach, and you want to teach, and, and God never called you to do these things. But you don't need to do what God, and if you believe that these things God has called you to do, your ministry will make room for you. Your, whatever God called you to do, it will make room for you. You'll be surprised where God placed you, and place you before kings. But if that's not the case, do whatever you do and do it unto God. Because at the end of the day, when God, when you stand at that beamer, that judgment seat of Christ, and God is giving you a reward, amen, it don't matter if you are a preacher, God will reward you based on what he gave you. And a lot of people are going to be so hurt because they're saying, boy, look how much things we do, but they never did it with the right heart anyway. So guess what? Don't even be jealous of what people do. Just do what you have to do. It's an enemy that the enemy wants to use to cause division. Because when I'm jealous against you, I can't work with you. But when I understand the purpose and the mission, then I realize that, look here, I might just be a small portion in it. It's just like, you ever, you ever realize, this, like cars, I had a car, in my car, something to stop work. I mean, I said to myself, say, no matter what me do, we can't figure out what it was. All the for somebody said, go check your, your fuse box. I'm going to open the box, and you could have seen that one of the fuse were burnt. It's as small as that fuse, that, that, that little thing is insignificant it was. By just that being defected, it caused a whole section of the car to stop work. In other words, you don't even understand how important you are in the body. You might not be the shiny part of the car that everybody see. You might be the fuse box. Amen. But that small fuse box is that little thing is that will cause, praise God, us. To, to make a lot of things not work. When you're out of your place, when you when you when you burn out and you're not functioning as you should, you can cause the whole thing to not operate as it should. Enemy number three, praise God, is the enemy of selfishness. So the Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse three to four, let nothing be done to strive or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let ease esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, Paul is writing to the church in Philippians and he's saying that whatever we do, we must do it practically promoting each other. You must put make your, you must exalt your estimate your brother better than yourself. Amen. I will find that hard because we're living in a season where everybody is for themselves. The Bible said the spirit speak expressly that the last day some shall depart from the faith. Given here to seduce in spirits and doctrine of devils. Amen. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the scripture I'm looking for. It's saying the last is perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's the one. So if you look at it, if they are lovers of their own selves, that's where it starts. Because every one of the other ones that falls filter from the fact that you love yourself. You become covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, choose breakers, false accusers, incant all the list of things that comes down from that scripture comes from the fact that you are selfish. Brethren, we need to, as children of God, to realize that we don't need to be selfish because it's an enemy of unity. Enemy number four is the enemy of discord. And the Bible said, these six things does God hate. Yes, seven an abomination unto him. I tell you about them. A, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devise evil plans, feet that are swift with mischief, a false witness that speak lies. And I strongly believe that the seventh is as a result of the other six. Can notice all the other six has to do with a part of the body. Look, the eyes, the tongue, have to do with blood, hands, talk about heart, talk about feet, and talk about the speaking lies. But guess what? He that sowed this card among the brethren is aligned, no, it's not a body part, but it's in line with what all of these other parts come down. In other words, when you when you when you when you're proud, you get sow this card. Okay, you're going to think you're better than everybody else. When you lie, you're going to sow discard. Because, guess what? You're telling lie. Tell lie and sister so and so never do nothing at all, but you have to tell lie to protect yourself. 
When your hands shed innocent blood, and you're shedding innocent blood don't mean uh, you know the scripture talk about in the New Testament. Shedding innocent in the Old Testament, probably was talking about physical killing, but in the New Testament, Jesus said, Okay, if you ever hate your brother, you kill him. Hands that shed innocent blood, you so discard. Because a lot of us kill people by our mouth. Amen. Heart that device evil plan. You sit on your things, some wicked things where you're gonna do to the brethren. Amen. Even when the brother does nothing, you're, you're sitting on your plan it out. Watch your heart, brethren. Feet that are swift and run into mischief. You just want to hear, you know, as, as Bishop said the other day, you just want to hear bad news about somebody and you're quick to spread it. So guess what, brethren? Let us be careful of this enemy of discard. So it's discard among the brethren. How can we, and I'm closing, how can we restore and maintain unity? So God has called us to unity. And that the fellowship is one of the most powerful tools of witnessing to a lost and dying world. It's when people look on, they will know we are Christian. I said before, by, by the fact that we love each other. Amen. It's, it's one of the most powerful tools. When people look on and say, boy, we've seen something here that I, I don't get out there. I'm seeing something in, in the body of Christ that, that, that is different. I'm seeing this brethren love this brethren. Even though something go wrong, he still love the brethren. It's, um, it's the most powerful tool to witness the loss and a dying world. And guess what we have to do? We have to protect it. We have to understand that the enemy wants to invade our unity. We want to invade the unity that we have in the body, but we have to protect it. And when we don't have it, we need to strive for it. We have to ensure that, look here, if you realize that there is an issue, strive for unity. Do your best. Do as best as you can for, to create unity. Sometimes you might be shy, if something might happen, but try for at least, strive for unity. And thoroughly do everything we can to promote it. In other words, let unity be the thing that we talk about. Let that be the first thing that's about our brethren. You know, you do be something wrong, you know, but, you know, um, the first aim to ensure that we don't open the gate to the enemy. Is that we want to protect the unity. We want to strive for it. We want to do everything to promote it. So that we don't open the gate. That the enemy will come in and invade where we, what we have in the body of Christ. Now there are, there, there, there are those three things. And this is the last slide. That I want us to understand. For us to ensure that we restore and maintain our unity. There are more I could spoke, speak about. But time is at hand. One, we have to pray for each other. Brethren, it is difficult to be mad and to be angry at somebody. It's difficult to hold grudge your people. It's difficult to, to, to hold up somebody in your heart. Praise God. When you are praying for them. So the first thing I would say is that pray for each other. When you pray for somebody, it, 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 it kind of a way of flushing out the, 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 the angriness and the, the grudge. And the, 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 the anger and the mad, being mad at person. It's difficult for you to hold these things when you begin to pray. Prayer changes things, they say. But most of all, prayer changes us. Let me say that again. Prayer changes things. And that's a known fact. But one of the things we always, always remember is that what prayer does is that prayer changes us. I, I, I said it earlier. I said that. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a session, I thought somewhere else. I said, look here, when you go to the, the golden altar of incense, it is as closest to the Holy of Holies. And when you're close to the Holy of Holies, it means you're close to God. You're closer to God when you're in prayer. And when you're in prayer, you can't be close to God and it don't change something in you. When, 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 when Isaiah got a glimpse of God, he said, woe is me. Amen. When, when John saw the glorified Christ, he fell down on his face as dead. It changes you. It makes all your preconceived thoughts and everything else go out the window because it's about him. So the first thing we need to do to restore and to maintain unity is that we need to pray for each other. You see a brother going somewhere, going down a line, pray for them. Talk to them, but pray for them because at the end of the day, it doesn't only change them, but it also changes you. Second thing we have to do, we have to love each other. We have to love each other. Amen. And love is very important for us in the body of Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13 verse 8 that we must owe no man nothing but to love him. That's a powerful verse. Imagine, the Bible says, you know, for owe nobody, nothing else. If you were owe anybody anything, one thing you owe every person, and that's love. 
In other words, you have something for me. What is it? You owe, you owe me. Why you owe me love? And the Bible says that how we supposed to behave as the children of God. Love. So John 14, 20 says, If any man say I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For how can he love or hate his brother whom he, him, 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 him can't see and say love God whom he can't see? You have to love, you, 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 can't, you have to love your brother. If you don't love your brother, then you really don't love God. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sin. In order for us to maintain unity among us, we have to love each other. And lastly, we have to bear each other's burden. Amen. So the Bible actually teaches us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 that when we bear each other burden, that's how we know that we are children of Christ. Amen. There should be a place in your heart that, 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 that wants to lift up people who have fallen. There should be a place in your heart that wants to help others um, as they go along the path. Amen. There must be a place in your heart like the good Samaritan who said, boy, you know, I'm going to pour some oil in their wound. I'm going to be able to ensure that I'm going to tear them more and bring them out and show them out. Amen. It doesn't mean that you are in agreement with everything they do. But you can bear their burden because every child of God, we all have one aim. We are all going up to Jerusalem singing this song about unity. And we can only make it there when we are united. I pray God tonight that we understand, praise God, the power of unity. I pray God tonight that as children of God, we will, none of us, we have made mistakes in the past. All of us have, have, have slipped up. Amen. But John put it this way, if, if we say we have no sin, we, we, we are a liar and, and the truth is not in us. Amen. All of, each and every one of us have, 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 have had our experiences. But guess what happened? All of us together can accomplish some things that, 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 that would make the kingdom of the devil run. Make the devil's kingdom have to run. The moment we decide to combine our, our efforts, we are combined in, you, in, in terms of prayer. We are combined in terms of fasting. We are combined in terms of doctrine. We are combined in terms of what we do. We want to help each other. We want to love each other. We want to pray for each other. We're going to see some things happen. For there the Lord command the blessing. There the Lord command the blessing. So let me end by saying what David said. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He said, one, it is like the precious ointment that ran down upon the head, upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his feet. Note it came from top to bottom. It means that leadership, we must have unity. It always filter down from top to bottom. If there's disunity in the head, you're going to have disunity in the bottom. That's why you keep on saying it ran down from the head to the bottom. So that's another principle that we can see there. But you must dwell together in unity. For it is like the precious ointment that ran upon the head. And it's like the dew of Hermon. And as the dew that is sent upon the mountain of Zion. For there, in unity, the Lord command the blessing. Even life forevermore. I pray God tonight that we will try to apply some of these things to our lives. And we will pray, we will fight, we will ensure that we try to maintain the unity among us in the bond of peace. Because that's what God wants for each and every one of us in the body of Christ. We are one body, not two, not three. We are one body and we have to work together to get this work that God has placed us here in this life to accomplish. I pray God that we are blessed tonight. And that at the end of the day, we'll be united together. United we stand. There's a choir song we used to sing. Divided, we will fall. God bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's bow your heads as I pray. Great God, we exalt you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your love, your grace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word that you spoke to us tonight. I pray, now, God, for each and every individual who hears the word. I pray, God, that you'll help us, Lord Jesus, that we'll try to apply it to our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to love each other. Help us, Lord Jesus, to pray for each other. Help us, Lord, that when we will see our brother go astray, amen, we will, we'll, we'll analyze, we will, we will examine the world, we'll examine our lives, we'll examine what's happening in the kingdom of God, and we'll combine our efforts together to ensure that together we can restore what was broken down. I pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will be with us, that you'll continue, Lord, to let that spirit,
spirit of unity flow. Amen. That it would be like the oil that would be poured out upon Aaron's head. That it would be like the dew of Hermon. Amen. That washes the water from the top of the mountain even to the bottom and, and, and would fertilize the place. Help us, Lord Jesus, that we would have an expectation together. Amen. As we look forward, Jesus, amen, for our upcoming convention next week. As we look forward, Lord Jesus, as the, the convention that is taking place, even at Ascot, as we look forward for the convention that is taking place, that we'll be united together. Amen. That we'll be accomplished a lot for the purpose and the kingdom of God. Help us to realize, God, that it's not about uniformity, but we must be united, Lord Jesus, in doctrine. We must be united, Lord Jesus, in, in our expectation of you. And then we'll have a suddenly blessing like the day of Pentecost. We are present. Your Holy Ghost will come down and your Shekinah presence will take full effect in the house. Where there be healing, where there be blessing, where people will leave re refresh. Hey, God, Lord Jesus, we thank you, hallelujah, for what you are doing in our lives. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our present help even in the time of trouble. Oh God, continue to keep us. Continue to keep our bishop. Continue to keep this body, faith, apostolic ministry. Continue to keep the body as a whole. Amen. Because we know that any day now, you'll be put in your turn. And we march together towards the new Jerusalem. I pray God that you'll help us to sing this song in our lives. This song of unity. This song of unity among the brethren. We thank you one more time. In the mighty name of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to apply these things that we have learned to our lives. In the name of Jesus, for there you command the blessing, even life forevermore. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, brethren. God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name.